Uh, Gary has been a technical market analyst for over 30 years, a frequent contributor to Stocks and Commodities Magazine, and he's also written for Futures Magazine as well as Barron's. He's co-author of Trading Applications of Japanese Candlestick Charting, a John Wiley publication. His expertise includes a primary focus on a combination of Japanese candlestick charting with Western technical analysis. Gary will compare past events with technical information from historical historical gold prices and evaluate their effectiveness. He will then show you how to best how to use the best of these indicators to give you his 2014 outlook for gold. Uh, so with those details aside, I'll turn things over now to Gary. First of all, thank you very much. I want to welcome everyone to the room today. Uh, for me, I'd just like to do a sound check. Uh, if I see a couple of yeses, I know someone out there hears me. Uh, how is my sound? Perfect. Great. I want to welcome you today. It's a, a new year, 2014, filled with opportunities, filled with a lot of potential pitfalls. And it is my desire today to not only give you an outlook of where I think gold is headed this year, and I absolutely will do that, but more than that, to give you a sense or an idea of the technical indicators that I use and how I came to that fork in the road that led me to use the particular indicators that I use. <clears throat> I'm also what I, what I title a hybrid technician in that fundamentals are critically important to me. I absolutely believe that it is fundamentals that move the markets and not technical indicators. However, my reason, my personal reason for really going towards the technical indicators is I feel that mathematics is a much more pure language. And you know, when I first started learning about the markets, and this is back in the early 80s, 1983, 84 is when I became a broker, we, we really were ingrained with reading the news, understanding the fundamentals, and most importantly, understanding the relationship between A and B. If this happens, if the Fed does this, this should be the reaction. And as I started in my study some 30 years ago, what I realized was by the time any news got to me and I had dissected that news itself, it was typically too late. And anything, any trades that I would place, any assumptions, models that I would create were already factored into the market. So I always felt like simply looking at fundamental information always kept me a dollar late and a dollar behind. I was never able to kind of catch up to the curve. And so I was drawn very, very quickly into the art of technical analysis. And, and like most Western technicians, I began my studies with traditional and standard Western technical indicators. Now, I am going to recommend three books today. And these books were really Rosetta Stones to me in terms of uh, my education in these markets. And now, th some 30 years later, uh, what I want to do more than anything else is to be able to share that knowledge to present fishing techniques as opposed to simply fishing for you. And I'll, I'll try to do a little bit of both. We will definitely try to leave or reserve some time at the end for questions. But the first thing is we started to look at technical indicators. I looked at classic technical indicators, technical indicators such as moving averages or stochastics. And those to me were really the first kinds of technical indicators that I was introduced to. Now, my first recommendation for a book is if you want to learn about technical analysis itself, there's really nothing out there that is more of a Rosetta Stone than technical analysis of the financial markets. It's John J. Murphy. It, it's a, a it's a good book to just kind of, it's not a bedside book that you're going to read all the time, but it's a great reference book, and I highly, highly recommend this book for those that want to learn about Western technical indicators. But what happened very, very quickly in my learning curve is that as I use these moving averages, and I use stochastics, and RSI, and RMI, and Bollinger Bands, and I'll tell you a story about Bollinger Bands in a second, because John Bollinger is actually uh, one of my early mentors. I worked at a station called KY22 in California. For those that live there and remember that, it's the old UHF channels, and uh, John was the technical analyst for that station. 
and he actually wrote the foreword to uh, the first book that I wrote and has remained one of my idols in terms of what he was able to accomplish. But I saw a basic dilemma. And the dilemma that I saw on the screen that we're looking at, of course, right now is a screen of the gold market with a simple moving average and a stochastics behind it. And for those who, who follow this particular type of analysis, really what we're looking for more than anything, and let me make sure my colors are right on my drawing tools. Yeah, black won't come up on black. But in essence, what you're looking at in any kind of a moving average is if it's below that moving average line, of course, that's telling you that it's probably headed lower. And those are typical sell signals across above that is going to give you some sort of a buy trigger. Depending on the sensitivity of the moving average, it's going to give you a sense for where the market is in comparison to where the market was, moving average. Stochastics are a little bit different. They're not looking at average. What they're doing is they're comparing the highest high over n periods of days and then telling you that the current price is within 20% of the highest high or 30% of the lowest low. So it compares it to the extremes. But again, it's taking your current information, it's evaluating it as it compares it to historical perspective or historical reference. And what I mean to say by that is that Western indicators as a whole typically, typically, because there is exceptions, and the exceptions is what we really want to focus on, but as a whole, are lagging indicators. And the story I like to use when I talk about a lagging indicator is when, in my younger days, I used to be on the lecture circuit, and I did a lecture for Dow Jones Financial Symposiums. So they're an arm of the Wall Street Journal, and it's a world tour. I, I did one, one leg. Each leg was approximately one month at time. So it was a three-week tour. The one leg itself uh, took us to eight countries in Europe, Russia, some other places. And one of the other speakers was a gentleman by the name of Larry Williams. And Larry Williams, of course, wrote a book which basically states uh, how, how I turned 10,000 into 100,000, which he did. But what he told me, we were sitting having coffee one day, and, I, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can from these, these great, great minds. And he said, Gary, let me tell you something. You are no more than a steward on a ship sitting on the back of the ship, and you're looking at the wake that the propellers make. And you're, you're trying to ascertain in what direction the ship is going by looking at the wakes that are presented as this propeller moves through the water. And I said, okay, that makes sense. He says, but I want you to never forget one thing. And I said, what's that? He says, only the captain knows when he's going to turn the wheel. And so the thing about a lagging indicator is that, A, it always really compares its current scenario to past performance. And by virtue of that, it its predictive quality can only be as best as a lagging indicator can. And so for that reason, I felt that there really, hopefully, would be something else out there that gave us more insight or more information. And I started to look at the trend analysis, trend lines, channel lines, head and shoulders, flag formations, different Western technical indicators. And about two years into my studies, I was a commodity broker at the time, and I had a gentleman that for the last 15 trades had just absolutely nailed the markets. And, I, and when I say nail the markets, what I mean is uh, oil would be running up, it would hit up a, a new contract high. I would get a call from him and he would say, go ahead and sell, sell oil at the market. And I'd go, it's a runaway train. How, why would you want to sell it? He says, my indicators are telling me I should sell it. Okay. But what I saw this gentleman do, he was an engineer for General Electric on the East Coast. And I watched him time and time again really, really hit the tops and the bottoms of the markets. When he called and told me to sell it was typically one day or so prior to the top of the market. And after watching him for a couple of months and seeing the success and seeing his, his equity grow by leaps and bounds, I became really, really curious as to what techniques he used. And so I said, David, how are you calling the markets? Because 
you're using such a different different technique than any other technician that I've ever seen. And he said, well, here's what I'll do. Rather than tell you what I do, I'm going to send you a book. And so he, he in fact, did, and it arrived uh, Federal Express a, a little bit later. And the book that he recommended was by Seiko Shimuzi called The Japanese Chart of Charts. Now, you can research these anywhere. You don't have to get them from Amazon, but it was e just simply the easiest thing to be able to pull up for everyone. Now, the Japanese Chart of Charts was translated, I believe, in the mid-80s uh, from Japanese into English. And if you recall back in that time, some you know, 20, 30 years ago, the Japanese had become pretty ag aggressive traders in our markets, and they were using Eastern technical analysis. They were using techniques that we personally were not familiar with. And I got this book, and I began to read it. And my first read, I have to acknowledge, it made very, very little sense to me. It almost seemed like it was a cryptic code that I had to uncover. The second reading, things started to click, and on the third read, it was almost as though a light bulb went off. And what I realized that the Japanese had done, and remember that this technique was developed in the 1600s so that traders could analyze the Dojima Rice Exchange, the first commodity exchange in the world, and these techniques have been around for a very, very long time. But what they what this technique was able to do at least on on my take is that it was able to quantify market sentiment mathematically and that's that's the goal that's the golden goose that's the holy grail to be able to take how people feel and quantify it in a way that it makes sense for us to interpret said scores scores of things within the marketplace itself and so i i began to get very very interested in candlesticks and and as I started to study Japanese candlesticks everything about the way I understood the market began to change and in fact my trading got better uh, every client that I was able to to teach uh, was able to really get something out of it now I'm assuming that most people understand how a candlestick works but just real briefly for those that don't we'll we'll just go into a very very brief explanation of that and let me go ahead and kind of enlarge this now we have green candles and red candles then we have these what's called wicks or the difference between the open or close and the low and the high and in essence when you think of a standard bar chart on a standard bar chart really the only thing that you're looking at is a vertical line with the high and the low you typically on an open low high close chart you get a little slashed a, a horizontal line to the left of that vertical line and that represents let's go ahead and create one but you get a oh, forget about the fact that there's a an arrow there but you get a high and then you get a low but what happens is the Japanese look at the market in a very very unique way and the way that they look at the market is as follows. The Japanese believe that each day in the marketplace there is a basic war going on between the bullish faction and the bearish faction. And the visual representation of the outcome of that battle can be displayed in a candlestick. The only difference between a candlestick chart and a standard uh, bar chart is that there is a huge difference between way, the way we look at our markets and the Eastern technicians look at their markets. Because if you watch the news, for example, uh, the Dow Jones closed up 25 points, it closed down 300 points, it closed up 300 points. The basic way that we communicate price change to investors is to talk about where the market closed yesterday and compare it to where the market closed today or is currently trading at today. In other words, a Western technician puts a lot of emphasis on the relationship between close and close. That's where the first line charts came from. 
the Japanese technical analyst is unique in that to him it's not so much the close of the market but what he believes is the most important factor in a market is where the market opened that day and then where it closed that day because what that tells you the, the relationship between the opening and close tells you whether the bullish faction uh, were able to push the market down and keep it down in other words where they had the dominant control in the market or where the bearish faction or the bullish faction were able to open the market and push it higher and keep it higher and so that the size of the body in other words the price range between the open and close is very very important and there's different names for the different types of candles that it can get and the key when you look at a chart like this first of all visually it's easy to pick up up days versus down days and when I say up days I'm not referring to the comparison between the close of today and the close of yesterday I'm referring to the comparison between where it opened during that trading session closed during that trading session so these green candles here are telling you it opened but it closed higher red candles on this are simply telling you that it opened and closed lower well they, they took that one step further and they said that if you get certain formations in the marketplace certain formations that will actually be a pattern that's telling you that there's a likelihood of some sort of an occurrence and one of the things that they talk about are basically in terms of candle types themselves are a candle called a doji and a doji is simply where the open and close are very very close or identical you will get them throughout but you'll typically see on the tops or bottoms of the market as a market is bottoming what tends to happen you get these for example right here you get these red candles and as the red candles wane in size it's giving you an indication that the bearish factions beginning to run out of steam and that doji that point in which the market opens and closes at the same time is when it's almost undecided neither the bulls nor the bears were able to ultimately dominate the market when you see extreme lows you can see the points in time in which the bearish faction had control but the bulls took it back and bring it up to the high when they bring it up to the high of course what's happening is you're developing that range but if it closes if it closes right around the point in which it opened what typically happens when you have something like that is you get that pivot point and you can see that in these candles and we can we can go ahead and kind of blow them up just a little bit so you get a better indication of what I'm looking at but you will typically get on many many tops in the market you get these doji like candles and you'll also if it's building a base you can see the small size of these candles now you can take it another step because that's simply identifying a single day candle the next step is simply that our, our pattern identification so you see these dojis here but if you look at these four candles this green these two stars and this long red candle that is what I call basically a three river evening star variation the reason it's a variation you have two stars that are gapped typically you'll have one but there are defined patterns that give you information very very quickly that give you clues about the market for example this particular two-day pattern right here these candles here is simply called an engulfing bearish now an engulfing bearish is where you open above and close below it engulfs the entire range of the prior trading session to actually uh, take that call of course you get what's called a confirming candle and on a confirming candle which is the next day you've got to have a candle of course that is a red candle with a lower low and a lower high and that's going to give you some indication and I realized very very quickly that there was some insight in this particular technique that had no correlation had no corresponding sentiment to Western uh, technical analysis now some of these things kind of cross for example what we call a head and shoulders is a uh, it's is known as three mountains so there were unified approaches but there was something genuinely unique about candlesticks that really drew my attention to them now interestingly enough I found that although I was able to see these patterns a lot of the, the clients that I had at the time 
had difficulty and I came up with the idea to actually create a software product and it was a application called the, the candlestick forecaster that would do automatic identification and back testing of all these these candle patterns and what I found was that once I ran it through the mill and did the analysis although candlesticks were brilliant at calling tops and bottoms we would get multitudes of false signals during the marketplace itself where the pattern was correct but the the, the actual follow-through wasn't in other words it was not properly predicting what the market was doing but at the same time I realized I don't really take all of the calls I take certain patterns at certain points and my partner at the time his name is Brad Matheny he said well Gary how come you're able to kind of filter these things out where our program is not I said well I don't always take the calls and so what we did is we developed a filtering system for when we take a uh, particular calls in candlesticks and that's what really led me to this the really pinnacle point the second part of my discovery and that was candlesticks were great but when used alone without using them in conjunction with other things they could give you great information but they could also hurt you and I started looking at a technique that had been around really forever but I found that this technique when combined with candlesticks gave me a, a tenfold return it was something that was almost mind-boggling and I'm simply talking about Fibonacci and I use Fibonacci on a daily basis in conjunction with analyzing candlestick patterns but Fibonacci really I believe to be the foundation of any of the cornerstone of any really good uh, technical analysis and why do I feel that way and by the way it is the the cornerstone of Elliott Wave and we'll talk about that in a second but why do I feel that way well of course Fibonacci has been around for you know he's this is again another thing back in the 1600s and this is just from a math um, website but there's two things that you really want to keep in mind and really want to kind of understand and one is the Fibonacci numbers and then the golden section the golden section is really uh, that's an incredible incredible find if you know how to use it right and when, when we talk about uh, Fibonacci itself really all we're looking at is the sequence and the sequence is simply by taking uh, zero in one and adding them so you take the first number second number you add it and you get one and then one and two three three and five is eight so on and so on so by adding the last two digits you come up with this long sequence but here's the interesting thing the space between each of these numbers is always constant and the relationship to this or this ratio itself is a ratio that's found everywhere in nature you can see it in the way plants develop in the way uh, trees develop in humans you can relate it to the size of your body in relationship to how long your arms are uh, it's it's incredible and if you get only one thing out of this webinar it's that these numbers right here 0.61 percent and 1.61 percent are probably the most critical numbers that you will use in your technical analysis and and to give you an idea of what we're talking about to kind of put it into into real life this is a basic fib retracement that I have here and all I have done all I have done is I have taken and created one fib retracement from really the beginning of this rally you can see that the market had just come in right at around almost a thousand dollars but then that I think that was a, in fact was the first time that it was able to effectively close but from there it had this very very large correction and this long run here in which the market moved from about 700 all the way up to its record high which is over 1900 I think 1920 so single longest run in the history of gold when we create a fib retracement for this we get different levels and the different levels are what we want to know but again I talked about 61 being important and when we look at this simple fib retracement that was complete in terms of its time parameter 
This is what, uh, July of 2011? Yeah, July of 2011. These numbers right here, these lines were already hard pressed. They were in play. And they told us, they told us some information that in many instances will give us insight you just can't get anywhere else. Now, oddly enough, when we look at these recent lows that the market has hit, and this is the double bottom that has actually got me bullish, and we'll talk about the bear market truncation as we go into my outlook, but not exact by any means. You can see that it's slightly above this, but the fact that you can say to yourself that typically when a market moves from a dollar to two dollars, when it corrects, even if it's on a bullish path, in other words, what I mean by that is that Typically, in a marketplace itself, it's going to be a stair step. So it's going to have a, a, a rise or a rally. It's going to correct a certain amount, then a rise and a rally, certain amount like that. It stair steps up. And so what Fibonacci is able to discern is there's a natural sequence, a natural pattern in the way things occur that tell you that there's logical points to look for certain things to happen. Does that mean that the market's going to do that. Well, of course, absolutely not. But it gives us a little bit of insight in terms of being able to ascertain where the market might go. So this is basically a basic FIB retracement. You can see that more than just the single number lines up, it gives us more information. So for example, our 38%, we draw that right in here. You can absolutely see that as this market came down and tested the 61% and then comes up in rallies, it's quite interesting that it kind of falters right at this FIB number. And, for, and I see many names I recognize of my subscribers. My subscribers know how much weight I put towards Fibonacci because Fibonacci itself really attempts to outline a natural sequence or order and technical analysis is simply looking at market sentiment and trying to quantify it mathematically. To me, this is a very, very insightful tool. And as I said, if you only get one thing out of it, it's to remember those numbers, uh, 0.61 and 161. And by doing a simple FIB retracement, and pretty much all of the software applications do have that, you're able to come up with some pretty pretty interesting information uh, in the marketplace itself. Now, from there, there's also something that's called a Fibonacci extension. And on an extension, it's really part and parcel of the same thing. Again, you're looking at certain numbers, and let's go ahead and kind of line that up. And really, what I did in this particular study is I did what's simply called a FIB extension. And I looked again, this is really the beginning of this large rally right here. And as you can see from this chart, you can see here's where it hits that thousand and then backs off. So if I look at the first real rally itself, take it from there to there, and then I do what's called an extension, 138% takes us pretty much to the top. 121% takes us pretty much here. There is some information that's available. You can see then again, this top is at a 61% extension. And what's interesting is this 61% extension was a 61% retracement of the same move. In other words, what you'll begin to uncover with Fibonacci itself is that there's a fractal quality to it. There's a quality to this technique in which you are looking at things uh, kind of like a Russian doll where one fits into the other and into the other, but they're duplications of that same sequence. That's nature's building blocks itself. And so it's for that reason that we really look at this in such a high regard. So I now had Fibonacci and I now looked at candlesticks, and, and really the way that I combined the two of them was, as I said, there's specific patterns that we look for in the marketplace itself. And so that if, as a market is trading, if it hits a, for example, a certain level within the market, 
In essence, what I'm looking to do is see if I can uncover some sort of a candlestick pattern. This is a variation off a of Three River Morning, but it, it's really not that good. But as you, as you get to this top and you can see there's real resistance here, you get these series of dojis. So this is that Three River Evening Star variation. In fact, I did an article for Kitco News maybe uh, two and a half years ago where we actually looked at how many uh, variations I saw as the market went up. And so it really is an important component to putting together a technical model. Now, there's a third kind of a, a wheel that I use with this model, and, and that is Elliott Wave. And Elliott Wave to me is kind of like poker in that it will take you maybe a day or two to learn and a lifetime to understand. Secondly, it's an extremely subjective model in that a moving average is a moving average, and a 61% retracement is a defined hardcore number. But in terms of doing what's called that wave count, that can be subjective, and you, you'll get a lot of Elliott Wave technicians coming out with a different count or different conclusions based upon their count. So in that way, the, the reliability goes way, way down, but Elliott Wave attempted to do something that was never done before, and that was the, the, the whole meaning of what I'm trying to talk about, the difference between a lagging indicator and a leading indicator. Now, I believe candlesticks to be one of the earliest, if not the earliest, leading indicator that is. Because when you see a pattern, let's just go ahead and blow up a, a regular chart, but when you see a pattern such as these, this doji cluster, this is engulfing bearish, you've got uh, what's called a tri-star top here, and all of this is a variation off a of three river evening star, it's telling us that at this particular point right here, if, and I add the, confer, the confirming candle because it's a very, very good filter, but at this particular point, it's telling us that the market is going to head lower. Now, you get an engulfing bullish, it doesn't confirm, as you can see on the next day, the following day it does, but here you get another engulfing bearish. So we've gotten two engulfing bearishes, we've gotten a cluster of uh, dojis at the top, and that pretty much is telling us that what we can look for in the upcoming future is lower pricing. That to me, ladies and gentlemen, is a leading indicator. However, what it's not telling us is the timeline involved and where these lows might take us to. And so when you combine candlesticks, Fibonacci and Elliott Wave, and by the way, Elliott or Fibonacci is ingrained in Elliott Wave and, and the Elliott Wave principle. And in fact, when R.N. Elliott first revealed and did his study on the wave count that he developed, he didn't realize the connection to this, this uh, golden mean, this ratio, this, this Fibonacci sequence, until it was brought to his attention and he realized that he was using this Fibonacci in terms of his work incredibly frequent. Now, third book that I'm going to recommend to, to you today, and it's the last book I'll recommend, it's enough for one day, but this is R.N. Elliott's Masterworks, and really what it is, it's a collection of all of his papers and his knowledge. It's a incredibly good book in terms of wanting to learn about Elliott Wave. This is where you want to get your start after you kind of comb through the internet. So, in terms of what I recommend in every technical trader's library are these three books, Japanese Charter Charts, Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets, and then lastly, R.N. Elliott. So what, what have we been able to accomplish by actually putting these indicators together? Well, as I said, candlesticks gave us that mathematical view of market sentiment, and it would give us, most importantly, pivot points points to look for key reversals in the market. There are also patterns that are called continuation patterns, and they're telling you that the current direction of the market should continue. There are exhaustion patterns, but these patterns, when you are able to identify them and look at them fairly quickly, what you'll find is that when you start putting the three of these um, techniques together, 
it gives you some phenomenal insight into the marketplace itself and it gives you insight honestly that you're just not going to get really anywhere else now there's a really a third thing that we added to this and it's just very very old school but it's just basically trend analysis channel lines and trend analysis now we talked about the fact that when we did a basic fib retracement and the retracement was started from here to this particular top when we looked at the defined bottom this bottom itself came to about a 61 percent just a little bit above now here's another way that we can accomplish kind of the same task but it's it's western old school but it's an oldie but a goodie it, it tends to give us a lot of information if we peg these original lows here this being point one go ahead and get this up and then we take you got your rally and then we go to our secondary low obviously what we do is we create an angle and this angle from this low to this low gives us a tap in other words a defined way that this this particular angle moves up in at what degree is it is 90 degree 45 degree and when we do that what you'll see is that these recent lows are really still above this long long standing support line it's the resistance line right now that interests me mostly which is this resistance line right here we'll talk about that in a second but when you consider the fact that just by looking at the angle from here to here and drawing that up as this market came under fire there seems to be a logical reason that we could be in fact looking for a bottom and it's pretty easy when you when you want to think about it in a certain way let's go ahead and put our uh, our fib back up here so here as you can see just classic standard trend analysis combined with a fib retracement and what you'll see is that there is a point in time in which that you kind of get this intersection and lo and behold this intersection just happens to occur right at this most recent bottom now to define the techniques themselves and, and really the, the way that I looked at it I first published a paper and this paper was called the new technical triad and in essence uh, there are reprints available you can email me at Gary at the gold forecast we'll send you a link to that but I defined the fact that when I actually started combining different techniques I found that by putting together Elliott wave Fibonacci and candlesticks I was really able to get a pretty good grasp of the market and more importantly have a pretty unique way to look at the marketplace itself in a way that gave me insightful knowledge but usable tradable knowledge not the fundamental knowledge that as Bernanke speaks and people are reacting I'm, I'm a dollar late and a dollar behind it actually told me what I can look for and from there I realized that there was a way to combine these three techniques and to actually create models from them and that to me was really one of my big aha moments now this isn't complete we've just uh, started this but I basically wanted to go back and look at the calls that I've made the candlestick forecast was developed back in the uh, I would say 92 is when we had it copyrighted but the gold forecast which is a daily video newsletter in which we actually go we give our market analysis and give definitive concrete trade recommendations with stop placement and kind of walk all the way through it's my part of fishing not teaching people to fish I wanted to see how it I know that I was profitable year in and year out and by the way my first couple of trades this year have been losses I don't want to want you to think that this is a very very clear and easy road it's not but this is the track table as we put it together this is available on our site if you go to our site under comment uh, excuse me under our services you'll see this track record table that's so anybody can get to it and it's got 2010 11 12 13 
14's just started, but I'm being honest with you up front, I've taken two hits, three hits actually, in the marketplace, but I've kept my losses small because I keep very, very tight stops in a market. But if we look at year one, if you had invested $10,000 when the market had, or the, the gold forecast had first come out, by the end of that year, uh, you would have made about 30000 and so your $10,000 investment now was about 40000 You can also see that we have these little players. So what I've done is I've actually, we've created a way so that you could go in and take a look at the individual videos where I made those recommendations and see what I was thinking at that time. So as I said, this, was a, this is really our, our, our first year, 2010. In 2011, we were able to squeak another 32,000. This is with that same original $10,000 investment. You're up to 72. Uh, 2012, that was a fairly tough year. 22, now we're up to 95. And then last year, uh, we've just got done compiling them. Very, very difficult year, especially if you're a gold bull like I am, um, to be able to profit. I mean, you had gold down, what, 28, 30%. We actually made about 140% on the year. I, I look at it as dividing 10,000 into the amount. And so an original investment of $10,000 back at the beginning of when we came out with this, you know, if you had taken every trade, could have been, you know, a return of about 100,000. The reason I tell you that is that there is strength in this technique. There's absolutely, and realize there's incredible risk the risk will most definitely be substantial and losses can be occurred and in fact do get occurred. So I, I just want you to understand that uh, in terms of using any kind of a system itself. But when we put it all together, and that's what I want to do, because I really wanted you to get a sense for what we did, how we did it, and now with that in mind and some of the past results, I can give you an idea of what I'm looking at and where my current take on the market is. And to do that, again, I'm going to pull up a, a weekly chart. And on this weekly chart, let me kind of move these lows in here. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons that I really, really love working with eSignal, their, their charting platform is exquisite. There's, there's two of them that I use. This is one, and there's one other that I use. But the dynamics of their platform is incredible. I started working with eSignal when they were data broadcast company, DBC, and this is back in 1993 or 94. I've always loved their data. Their data is clean. And uh, an old programming saying is garbage in, garbage out. Without clean data, I can't do my job. And really what we're looking at here is a basic count of what we saw. And what I mean to say by that is as follows. The market will typically move up in a stair-step pattern. And the belief is that, that, that that is a series of waves. So you might have something like one, two, three, four, and then you'll get wave five. Now, within this one, two, three, four, five, in other words, this entire group is simply called your impulse phase. Oh, let me get another drawing tool up. This is what's known as your impulse phase, a series of five waves, one, two, three, four, five, and from there you will typically get what's called a corrective pattern, and a corrective pattern is typically what's called an A, B, C. So we're in this incredible bullish run. The market is moving up. It hits this record top. I thought it was going higher. I was wrong. Many people were wrong, but we started to get some signals, and so we got this A, B, C which is basically what's called a flat here. Your, your A and your C are about the same. And my sense was at this point, we were going to witness this market take off and go to new record tops because I thought that what we witnessed, one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, completes the entire cycle of eight waves. And what will happen is as long as the sentiment that it was, was available when this market went up is still in the market, this cycle will simply repeat itself. So I was looking for the market to do as follows. One, two, three, four, and five, and go to new highs. Well, nothing could have been further from the truth. It absolutely wasn't the way this market played out. And as we look at it in hindsight, the first clue we really got 
that something was amiss was right here because for our current Elliott wave model to work, if we went back into a bullish impulse phase right in here, we had to break above this particular top, but we didn't. And that's where we actually started our bear count. The fact that the market couldn't make it through here, we had this double top, rather than this being a what's called a bull count, uh, one through five, we got a bear count one through five. And a bear count is is simply the opposite of our bull count in which we got waves one, wave two, wave three, wave four, and then wave five. We'll talk about this part because that's really where, where the outlook comes from. And in the same way that, as I said, we looked at a scenario like this, one, two, three, four, five, at this top, we looked for what's called the counter trend. And the counter trend is what's called your corrective period, basically made up of an ABC. So you go one, two, three, four, five, and then, let's move this over a little bit. And then from there, of course, you get an ABC correction. Now, the difference is you've got your long wave three, your four, then you'll go into your five, and typically fifth wave is going to be below wave three. So in a standard marketplace itself, you'll get a lower low. However, when we hit this double bottom, it brought up the idea that what we could be witnessing was simply called a bear market truncation. And what I want to do for you is I put together a little video of a bear market truncation, but realize that I put this video together back in the end of November, beginning of December. It's only about three minutes. From there, we will absolutely give you our outlook for 2014. And the pattern that I kind of want to discuss with you is simply it's a bear count, but it's it's a bear market truncation. And this comes directly from uh, some work by Frost and Prechter off of the Elliott Wave Principle and it is a truncated fifth wave. And in essence, what you're looking at is this. Typically, on a bear count, uh, what you're looking at is one, two, long third wave, four, and your fifth wave will typically be what's called a standard zigzag in which the low of three is going to be a, above the low of five. Now, when you have equal lows, we've, we've talked about this many times, it's simply called a flat, or a truncated fifth wave. Now, why am I presenting this to you at this point? Let me show you. I've simply pulled up our two-day chart that has our current Elliott wave count. This being the top of two here, which of course is going to match this two right in here, will match to this two right in here. And from there, of course, we have our long wave three here. This is our long wave three here, and this is what forms that low. This is the key to looking at this pattern. Now, from this, we get our ABC, or we get our fourth wave up, just as we get here. And I have been talking about the fact that wave one and wave three, and I'm talking about this wave one here and this wave three, should at least be equal, and that's what has plotted our lows to at least match these lows at around 1181. However, we've actually come fairly close. And with this recent low of 1211, we're just $30 off of this low. So what this particular bear market truncation pattern would look like if in fact it would unfold. And as I said, traders, I'm not giving this an incredible, a high probability of unfolding this way, but it is nonetheless something that we can look at. We have come actually fairly close now to the lows. So we've gotten our matching lows down here. And then with those matching lows, of course, we would get then get a spike to the upside here to end this one, two, three, four, five, and we would in essence go into an ABC, which is the counter trend, but that would, that would certainly be signaling higher prices in gold, if in fact the market held in this area. So as you can see, I've really, I've removed the candlesticks, everything to identify uh, and focus only in on a wave count, in essence, what we would look at if it was to unfold something like this is we had two, three, we have four. 
this is the truncated fifth, and then you would move back up. Now, how can we determine if, in fact, that's what we're looking at? Well, a couple of things have to happen. The first thing is the market would have to trade over uh, 1255, 1260, where we have our stops, there's a triple top there. Until that's taken out, we've got to remain bearish, one. Secondly, uh, most necessary would be, we've got this really long standing uh, trend line, this resistance line, and this resistance line has been incredible in terms of pointing out these last two recent tops in the market because we had the failure to really kick above that point and see the market kind of genuinely as it was trading up break through this or to break through the resistance here because it wasn't able to we've identified this really really strong resistance line we'd have to break through that also now of course as this market moves down so does this slope so where that would intersect would be something we could talk about on another show but Nonetheless, we have actually gotten fairly close to having what's called basically a flat. And a flat is one in which you have waves three and five really have the same low. It's also known as a bear market truncation. And I thought it was close enough that we can at least watch to see if it unfolds in this way. As I said, we would have a long way to go before I would get bullish, but if in fact the market were to get bullish these are the things that we would see at this point but as i said we would need some confirming technical evidence of which we haven't gotten any yet but nonetheless the fact that we're now near these lows at least warrants us considering that as a possibility a model in which the market could unfold it's worth our thought anyways all righty. Uh, as I said, that was something that I put out back in December. Now, I did get a question, and I want to address this immediately, and this is by Bruno, that the Elliott Wave, what, what he's speaking about, and I have to make sure that if you're referring to the one through five count on, the, on that long uptrend, I was just putting in uh, the fact that it's one through five. If, if four goes into two, it's absolutely invalid. Uh, let me go pull that up again. All right, there's, there's no question about the fact that there is three golden rules in Elliott Wave. And the first of those is that wave three cannot be the shortest, wave two cannot exceed wave one, and wave four cannot overlay up wave two. And what they mean by that, I've got to change the color of this. What they're referring to is you've got this one wave up, you have your corrective wave. This is wave two in a bull count. Market moves up, and then you get a corrective wave in wave, this is your wave four. So one, two, three, four, five, two and four are your corrective. Your impulse is one, three, and five. This low right here cannot go into the territory of this high. And that's what Bruno was, was mentioning, uh, the fact that these two cannot intersect. And so that I just want to make sure that if what Bruno was talking about was my basic count as I went up, I could have easily mislabeled the count. In terms of this coming down though, and this is the count we're using Bruno, and, and that's why I, I want to clarify. Wave one, this is wave two. This is the bottom of wave two. Wave four cannot come in two this zone right here and that i believe is what bruno's trying to mention bruno did i answer your question because that's important to me i don't want to give out the wrong information wave four cannot overlap wave two and you don't see it overlapping this is wave four right here this is wave two there's zero overlap okay and that should hopefully answer answer the question okay Now, in terms of where we are and where I think we're going, and then if you could hold your questions till the end, I'll try to leave some time for that. I realize I'm running on a little, little bit longer than I'd hoped to, but I tried to cover a whole lot of material here today. But in essence, what I'm looking at is this. We have this long wave three down. You have your corrective wave 
4 and 4 does not overlap into wave 2. This is our wave 2 right here. There is no overlap. We go to wave 3, and as I said, typically wave 3 and wave 5, you're going to have a lower low on wave 5. When we hit this particular bottom, this, this double bottom here, it gave me a sense that we at least want to look at the idea that what we're witnessing is a bear market truncation. Now, the second thing that I found uh, to be very revealing and insightful was if you look at these series of tops, you had a triple top here at 1800. That was the last time right here that the market actually hit 1800. When this market had this tremendous fall from grace here, this tremendous move down, and hit this particular bottom, when we saw this matching bottom come up and it start to spike off of that, we could be looking at two different scenarios. One is that wave, this wave five hasn't completed, so you're getting one, two, three, four, and that would state you're getting a fifth wave down to complete it, and it's not a bear market truncation. And as I said in that video, what we really want to look at is what technical evidence are we going to need to ascertain that it is breaking out of that. And if we, I'm going to try and draw this as straight as I can. When we look at this long-standing resistance line, and this resistance line was created from when the market fell, let me get a color I can use, by looking at these particular tops here and then carrying that angle lower, what it told us was that we had one real rally in 2013. Market comes down, hits 1181, and then moves up to 1435. Now, 1435 is really the upper level of this resistance line. It doesn't break through and, in fact, then begins to trade lower. You get another smaller rally, and it, once again, it comes to this line, doesn't break through, moves back down. Now, on this last rally, at least for the time being, and this is why we're in this nebulous area, I defined, I do a, a show called Chart This for Kitco News. It comes out two, three times a month. And I said that we had absolutely broken above this long-standing resistance line. Lo and behold, the next week it kind of went back to that line. That's this red candle here. In fact, let's, uh, let's blow this up a little bit. And we'll put back our resistance line. Um, we clearly saw that, really, for the first time, in almost any way you want to look at it. Now, as I said, that is, of course, one distinct possibility. Of course, my sense, my sense is that we are probably I apologize. Going to lower pricing. And the way that I believe is... I'm sorry about that. I don't know how that got turned back on. But, um, in essence... What I feel is very, very interesting right now, let's redo this, uh, is the fact that we, could, we have clearly, clearly moved above an area that we have not moved above before. But we're just right there. And so to me, if we remain above this particular resistance line, this long-standing resistance line, we are getting our first real clues that we're going to enter our corrected period, our corrected period would be an A, a B, and a C up. And so to kind of put it all into perspective, what I'm looking at right now is the potential for this marketplace to move higher. Uh, I have different areas of resistance that I'm looking at, but there's a key difference that we have witnessed at the beginning of this year that we've not seen before, we've not seen all through 2013. 2013, we watched this market in a virtual meltdown. But for the first time since this market has melted down, we have actually seen it test this long-standing resistance line. And at least for now, it is trading above that. And to me, that's absolutely bullish sentiment. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I will try and answer some questions and try and define what we're talking about. But most importantly, thank you very, very much for coming about arguing about waves. Yeah, we can go. I said from the beginning that in terms of a wave count, you got to follow those three rules, but different technicians have different counts. So, with that in mind, are there any questions?
right. Gold. What about silver? Um, silver right now is, is actually, if you look at the two charts side by side, and I don't have any up right now, but it's been in almost a defined band in which you've got about 20, 20, 50 on the high, $19 on the low, and it's trading in this range. When you compare a daily chart of how gold has broken out as it came off of these lows at 1181 and moved up to almost $100 higher, you're not getting that same correlation in silver. I, I don't, I'm not as bullish on silver as I am on gold right now. Um, uh, wave three is toughest uh, to get the count on. Um, does time play into this? Is a, and that's a very, very good question. There, there is a thing called Fibonacci time extensions. However, neither Elliott Wave, Fibonacci, nor candlesticks put time in as a reference or give you any predictive quality about how long it might take for a particular wave itself to unfold. You're looking for particular numbers and not a time sequence. Um, call me. Okay. Uh, how could uh, gold market mean? The gold market manipulation, you know, that's a, a $64,000 question. I don't, cont I don't like the word manipulation. And the reason I don't like the word manipulation, listen, I believe that the big boys are kind of uh, honing together and working in cahoots, so to speak, and moving the market. And they especially love to do it in between Christmas and New Year's or times when volume is low. Are they manipulating it? Well, Again, I think that these big boys are taking advantage of anything they can. It's a capitalistic market in which you're allowed to do things if you're smart enough to figure it out. My sense of it is you're not going to change that, so you're either going to get caught or, or ride their shirt tails. But it is what it is. I don't call it manipulation as much as some real smart playing in there. And although I'm not part of that group, I don't consider it manipulation but it is some very, very shrewd trading techniques. Um, gold over in the next day or two. Really what I'm looking at right now, uh, this is, let's go, let me pull up a daily chart. I mean, the key right now, the key right now is staying above certain levels. The level I'm looking at right now is I think it's 1242, 1243. Above that to me is, is, is pretty, pretty supportive. You can see this particular bottom here comes in at around 38, and this bottom here comes in around 41. And, and that's what I'm looking at is these series of bottoms in the area. If that support holds, the one really key characteristic when we look at this market is the fact that we've had these series, except for this aberration, and this is market manipulation, as you call it. Um, it was literally there for, oh no, this is the day it was literally there for a split second and then moved back up. Um, but you can see that we are getting this defined series of higher highs and higher lows. Simply look at four tops in the market, and we can see our real resistance right in here. And then we have another real level of resistance right here. I'm simply looking at tops. And what you find is when you do the Fib retracements, they kind of line up. Uh, where are we? Uh, what about, uh, and I might miss some, uh, how about the Fed tapering? Well, I think that the Fed tapering has absolutely already been kind of factored into the market. And realize tapering is not ending it. Uh, we've done two taperings. We were up to $85 billion dollars a month of hard asset purchases by the Fed. They're down to 65 billion, billion with a B. In other words, if you, I, I think that they're at uh, like two or three trillion, the collective amount that they have actually purchased since QE, QE2, QE3 started. I think the tapering is, is it's got to occur at some point. I think the longer it goes on, the more long-term repercussions we might get out of that. Um, This time, and then you have to excuse me. I'm an old man, not wearing glasses, and I'm trying to read these as quick as they come in. Uh, Gary, a lot of experts are looking at a major low to still appear in June in gold. 
1K or lower, do you concur? The lows that I am looking at on my model um, are about 1080 if, in fact, the market breaks down. And that's a really good question because originally, if you recall on my wave count, let's go ahead and pull that chart back up. Oh, I'll just do it. I'll do it from scratch. Um, on my wave count itself, let this fill in. We looked at this is ah, uh, there we go. So we looked at this long wave down three. You've got wave four, and wave five should have typically given us a lower low. This is our wave five here. And wave five, I forecast that if it was equal to wave one, because on some of the uh, golden rules, one of, one of the models is that typically wave one and wave five are about equal in length. That took us to 1080. That's actually where I, I came up with that particular model. And let me show you where that model comes from real quickly. This is just in terms of um, Elliott Wave, a very, very classic model. And so you have Wave 1. Wave 1 is your benchmark. You get Wave 2, and that's in terms of its retracement. You're typically going to get a retracement of up to 61%. Wave 3 cannot be the shortest of them. It can equal Wave 1. But typically, you'll look at it to be as much as 1.61 that of Wave 1. And again, Wave 2.61. I hope that you're starting to see something that to me is the, the most important thing to take out of this, this lecture, and that's 0 0.61 and 161, how important they are. Um, but then you'll look at wave 5 as equaling wave 1. Now that's on a bull count, of course. On a bear count, it's very much the same thing. So with that in mind, I was looking for this market to head and there's the line right there. That's where it comes from is 1080. I thought that that was possible. Now, if in fact what we're looking at is we've had these series of waves right now and we're still within wave five, we don't have that truncation, you could in fact see that. Now, how will I really determine, you know, which model seems to be the best suited model? And the best I can tell you, the best I can tell you in terms of what I would look at is this long-standing resistance line. We get a clear, because you can see, no matter how you put it, we're, we're right in this area. We get a clear break above that. We are out of this five count, bear count, and we're into the corrective phase, which would mean you would get an A, a B, and a C. And I'll try to take a couple more questions. Um, they're coming in so... Um, How does the next corrective phase compare to Fibonacci? Um, in terms of when you look at the, the counter trend, let me see if I can pull that one particular chart up. You know, the Internet's got all kinds of stuff, and you can search it, but... The relationship between all of your waves, and you were talking about the correction, is these are your guidelines or, or uh, some basic rules um, in which you can create the models itself. And so, time permitting, there's no way I can go into all of the relationships. But to, to answer your question, all of, all of these numbers, even in Elliott Wave, are all FIB-based numbers. And you can email me with your specific question. Where would the corrective A, B, C take us to? And that's, that's really, that's the money question there. My models right now put the A, B, C potential top as high as I think it would go. In other words, if we're going to stay in a bear count, so we got this one, two, three, four, five. Let's assume that five has ended and we're in some sort of an A, B, C. The upper end of that model puts us roughly 
at this top here or 1435. So if we get this corrective ABC and it does occur, the, what the next series of waves are going to be A, B, and C. And so hopefully that will, will answer your question. And I'll try to take one more. Uh, that's what... Uh, and what's our forecast on February or March? I'll take that as the last question. Right now, the money question, as far as I'm concerned, is whether or not we have this defined breakout. Because this defined breakout is going to say that for the first time since this market has dropped, and just as we had a parabolic rise, we had basically a parabolic fall. And so these attempts here, these failed attempts here, told us that that bear count was still in play. If, in fact, it breaks here, and it's a little bit over, but then backs off, we're still at 5. And as I said, this is where that low would come in. These are the 1080 lows, and that's the model I developed it for. The other opportunity, or the other option, is that we get a clear and defined breakout above this line, and if that's the case, we're going to go into that A, B, C scenario. And in terms of those numbers, I kind of showed them to you on that little table that we have. Uh, one thing that, that you can do, if you would like, is on our website, and all of this, of course, there's no charge, but uh, we have defined not only that trade table, you can go through and look at things, but we have also uh, just implemented a forum and what I would suggest to those that have real questions, you can to be able to post the question onto the forum, you need to be a member. So you can sign up for the Chartist membership, and the Chartist membership is absolutely free. And within there, we just put this up last week, but for all of these questions I have not been able to answer, uh, go in, sign up for the, uh, the Chartist after the show, and you'll simply create a free account then you'll be able to access the forum from there, post the accounts, and we'll get in, because these, the multitude of questions I'm getting and the depth of the answers required by no means can be done uh, on this. I'm already running, in my eyes, 15 minutes late. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate very much you guys taking an hour of your time to work with me, and I hope that that hour of your time will lead you to the road that you're trying to get to in terms of your trades. Please join us for the free account with Chartis after the show or sign up for our daily uh, review. Thank you again. Bye-bye.